All right, guys, what part on your bike do you care least about? Besides your rear tire, I mean. I'm willing to bet that it's your chain. I'm Mike Levy, today on The Explainer, we're gonna talk about where chains came from, why they look the way they do, and we'll address a couple common misconceptions, like stretch. Chains don't stretch, people. Chains first started showing up on bicycles way back in 1876, but that was actually around a decade after penny farthings were all the rage with rich Parisians. But the trouble with the penny farthing is that people were sitting about five feet up on top of this giant wheel with the cranks driving it directly. So when they wanted to go out to the le restaurant or to get some cigarettes, these were like fixies, but with a lot less hip and a lot more injuries. So people were getting hurt all the time, but eventually a guy in England said, why don't we just make both wheels the same size? It seems obvious now, but I guess back then, Trouble was, with both wheels being the same size and the front wheel doing the steering, they had to figure out a way to drive the rear wheel. Guess what happened? That's where chains came in. So at this point, chain drives had been around for seven or 800 years or something like that. If you go back far enough, there are actually drawings of a chain driven arrow shooting crossbow thing that looks crazy. Anyways, around 1879, one of those English guys said, hey, we can drive the rear wheel with a chain. Now there were a few other ways to do this, including some lever linkage things that were pretty weird. Chains ended up winning out though, because you could adjust the gearing easily by changing the size of the cog and the chain ring. Pretty simple. So since we're in the Wayback Machine, let's talk about a couple old chains that are long gone. There was a few weird ones out there. The first one is the simple bar link chain. Now, if you were to ask a six or seven year old to draw a bicycle chain, it's probably gonna look like the bar link chain. Now it used a one inch pitch. That's the distance between each of the pins. No rollers or bushings though. It was heavy and inefficient and it disappeared in the early 1900s, at least from bicycles. Another strange chain is the skip link chain. Now this one is pretty weird. It used outer links of alternating length and that made it relatively efficient for the time, but it disappeared around 1950 as the modern roller chain began to take over. The strangest one though, that has to be the Simpson lever chain. Now, this one was basically a whole bunch of tiny little triangles all attached together. The inside of the triangles rode on the chain ring and the outside of the triangles drove the cog. Now its maker said that that provided you with some sort of extra mechanical advantage. Now this was back in the late 1800s in bicycle racing. It attracted crowds of 20,000 people. So this was, it was a really big deal, but its popularity took a huge nosedive right around that same time and the lever chain, well, it's long gone. And all that weirdness, it eventually brings us to this guy, the modern roller chain. It was invented by two German brothers back in 1898. Now there are a whole lot of different kinds of roller chains out there, but all modern bicycle chains, they sport a half inch pitch. There's maple cream everywhere. Pitch is the distance from one pin to the next. So regardless of whether it's a single speed BMX chain or a fancy 12 speed Eagle or XDR chain, pitch is half inch, which is 12.7 millimeters. Now a lot of those old chains, like the step chain, the pitch on those was a full inch, was twice as big. Now that doesn't feel nearly as smooth when you're pedaling. So that's one of the reasons that modern chains have a half inch pitch. Okay, so let's take a chain apart and see what's going on. These here, these are the outer plates. This is the inner plate here. And then these are the rollers. Now, as you would expect, the rollers let the chain roll over the teeth on the cog and the chain ring. A lot of those old chains that are long gone, they didn't have rollers. So the pins ran directly on the cog's teeth and the chain ring's teeth. Now, as you would expect, caused a ton of wear, a ton of friction and a ton of problems. The rollers run on these little things here, these stamped shoulders on the inner plates. This is called a bushingless design. Prior to this, there was actually a bushing in there that the rollers spun on. 
but now they can just spin on these and it makes everything much less complicated. And then you have the pin that runs through everything and hopefully holds everything together. Now chains can look a lot different as well too. You could have super, super wide chains like this. This is a single speed BMX chain and it does not have to pass through a derailleur and there's no gears obviously. It's just running on a single cog and a single chain ring. But chains that have to deal with multi-speed drive trains well, they have to be skinny enough to not rub on the cog next door, but also wide enough to actually shift properly. And that's why we have different width chains for 10, 11, 12 speed drive trains. 10 speed chains, they're six millimeters wide measured at the rivet. An 11 speed chain, well that's five and a half millimeters wide. And a 12 speed chain is 5.3 millimeters wide measured at the rivet. Now you can mix and match manufacturers. It doesn't really matter all that much, but what you can't do is mix and match between speeds. For best results, you wanna run a 10 speed drivetrain, 10 speed chain, 11 speed, 11 speed chain, 12 speed, use a 12 speed chain. If you take a close look at your chain, you'll also see that the plates aren't just flat. Now they're shaped like this to help speed up shifting and to reduce friction. If you pay extra money, you could also find chains with cutouts in the outer plates and hollow pins, both things that are designed to save a little bit of weight. We're talking like 20 or 30 grams over the entire length of a chain, so it's up to you if it's worth it. You pay a little bit extra money, you could also get rust preventative coatings, you can get stainless steel chains, you can get chains with coatings with friction reducing properties, but None of that matters one bit if you don't take care of your chain to begin with. That's exactly what we're gonna talk about next. How do you take care of your chain? It's pretty simple. You make sure that it's clean and that it's lube. To lube your chain, you drip a bunch of lube across the bottom, you know, think one drop at each roller on the top of the chain and on the bottom of the chain while pedaling backwards. This is not rocket science. You then wipe the rest of the lube off. Lube on the outside of the chain, for the most part, it does nothing except attract dirt. That wears your chain out and it makes things very messy. So, lube your chain, keep it clean, it'll last a long time, and so will the rest of your drivetrain. Okay, let's talk about some common misconceptions that people have when it comes to chains. So, when I was a kid, I used to think that my chain broke because I was putting out so much power. That is definitely not the case. Chains don't break, no matter how many squats or lunges you're doing. We're gonna talk about the chain's tensile strength first. To do this, I did some Googling and I found a test online. It was done by a chain manufacturer and it was in 2007. Um, and it's with 10 speed chains, but it gives us an idea of how strong these things are. I'm just gonna read the numbers because there's too many of them, I don't remember. The test had numbers ranging from 9,100 newtons to 10,800 newtons. That's 2,000 to 2,400 pounds of force required to pull the chain apart. So in other words, a chain could hold a Toyota Yaris up like this. For chains to be sold, they also have to meet the European ISO standard at 1,800 pounds. You're not putting that out from those little toothpicks either, so don't worry about it. So, why did your chain break? Well, it's because you f***ed up, kind of, to be honest with you. A lot of it has to do with shifting under load. That's right. That massive one horsepower that you're putting out, well, it increases the chance of one of the teeth on the cassette prying the outer plate off of the rivet. That starts a chain reaction, and the whole thing twists apart, and there you go, broke the chain. Sometimes it's just bad luck, but the answer here is to work on your timing. You need to ease up on your power a little bit while you're shifting, that decreases the chance of a broken chain. Next misconception, that the narrower the chain, the weaker it is. All testing points towards that being wrong, with modern 11 and 12 speed chains having higher tensile strength and being more reliable, than wider chains that were built using less modern materials and less advanced manufacturing techniques. Things like much better tolerances and flush pins have made things way more reliable recently than they ever have been. Next up, why aren't we all using shaft or belt drives? Now, the reason for this comes down to us putting out 
around one measly horsepower, no matter how much we train, we don't get a ton more power. So our drivetrain needs to be extremely efficient and shafts and belts, they're not. Meanwhile, a chain in a lab setting, it's been recorded as being up to 98% efficient, obviously slightly less than that out on the trail, but you're still looking in the 90% figure. I know what you're thinking, you don't really care about that stuff if you're riding a 35 pound all mountain bike up a hill and you have knee pads and a full face hanging off your handlebar, but a lot of people do and it does make a difference. So I want an efficient drivetrain, I'm still gonna pick a chain. Another thing to note is that belts and shafts obviously don't work with a derailleur. Let's also talk about quick links and how you're not supposed to reuse them. Something that I have definitely done. Companies don't want you to reuse them because of tolerances. It all comes down to tolerances. When you put a quick link on and you take it off a bunch of times, that could change and that means it's less reliable and the chain could break under use. Last but not least, and my personal favorite, is that your chain stretches, which is definitely not true. So what's actually happening is that as your chain wears, you're removing material from the rollers, the shoulders that they ride on, and even from the pins. As those rollers get smaller, the distance between them is effectively growing. That changes the pitch of the chain. Why does that matter? Well, if the pitch of your chain is changing, it's obviously not gonna match the cog or the teeth on the chain ring anymore. When you put the power down, the chain doesn't fully engage on those teeth and instead of turning it, it slips over top. And well, we've all been there. You go knee first into the stem or maybe you go over the handlebars. It's never good. It's never good. So if chains don't stretch, why is an old chain longer than a new chain? Well, that's because as the pins wear, the holes that those pins are pushed through also wear. That free play adds up over the length of a chain, and there you go. All of a sudden, it's a little bit longer. All right, so that's it for this episode of The Explainer. If you guys want us to talk about something, put it down below in the comments, and we'll have a look, and you might see it on a future episode.